Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. There we go. Um, I am happy to be up here preaching once again this morning, and I just want to give you a heads up. I have a hard passage to preach this morning, um, and that's okay, but I just want to be forthcoming with you. It's bringing a lot of nerves, and I hope that we all can find a great message within this passage. It's in the Bible, so there is a message for us. And uh, before I jump into what that story is, I want to kind of review what Pastor Charlie has been talking about. He's been summarizing in the last couple of weeks the life of Jacob. And I want to, as quickly as possible, summarize his summary, just in case you missed it, um, because it's important, it's, it's pertinent to what we're going to talk about today. And so um, there are a few things that we need to look at. And so we need to remember, first of all, that Jacob was known as the trickster. He was a, he's a tricky guy, and he was kind of a jerk, if we're being honest. Um, he'd been working for years for his father, Laban, to be able to find his, uh, to, to pay, pay for his wives, to earn his wives. Um, and God appeared to him eventually once he'd married, and he said, uh, go back to Bethel. Go back to the land of your fathers, the land that I have given you and your fathers, and I promise to be with you. That's the message God gave him. And Jacob does it, but he does it in the sneakiest way possible. He leaves in the middle of the night. He's like, he brings his wives out to the field. He's like, this is, this is what God told me to do. And so we're going to do it, but be ready to go tonight, okay? And then they just like take off in the middle of the night. No, no bye, to their, bye to their dad, none of that. And so he's traveling back, and he knows that he is about to encounter the first victim of his deception, of his trickiness and his sneakiness. Um, and rightly so, because he's going to encounter his brother Esau, who he stole the blessing from, who he deceived, along with his father Isaac. And he's really nervous because Esau vowed to kill him when he was fleeing. So he has good reason to be nervous. Um, and so when it comes time to meet up with Esau, Jacob does everything that he can to protect himself. He uh, sends all these peace offerings, these gifts, um, to hope, hopefully to appease Esau. He sends like goats, goats and sheep and camels and cows and donkeys and servants. And then he sends one wife and her set of kids. And then he sends the other wife and her set of kids. And just as he's about to nervously cross this river into the part of the land where Esau was, God in the form of man wrestles with him and gives him a new name. And Jacob goes from being called the deceiver, which thanks mom and dad for naming me that, right? Um, he goes from being named the deceiver to being called Israel, the man who struggles with God. Jacob would go from wrestling with men and triumphing over them like he triumphed over Esau and Laban to wrestling with God, who he also mysteriously triumphed over. And that would become the story of the nation of Israel. They would face trials and these perplexing times and situations where it seemed like God was actually fighting against them and they were wrestling with God. But it ultimately would, would reveal that God was on their side, that he would triumph, and that meant that Israel would triumph as well. So that was the end of chapter 32, and then in chapter 33, Jacob actually reunites with Esau, and it's a good reunion. There's forgiveness. Esau forgives him for the stuff that he did, um, and they reunite, and then Esau's like, bro, come back and see my dad, see our dad. Come back and, and live in our land. And Jacob's like, yep, I'm going to come. But he deceives Esau. Once again, having just received this new identity, he, he deceives Esau, and he's like, but first of all, you go ahead. First of all, I have to, like, organize my family and my caravan. We got disorganized in that little, like, ploy to make sure you accepted us. And so we need to reorganize. It's going to take some time. You go ahead. I will follow. And then he doesn't go. He goes a little bit. He, he settles, ends up settling in a land that's, like, 20 miles away from where God had told him to go, in the land of Shechem. It's willing, halfway obedience to what God had asked him to do. And so he buys a, a plot of land from the Shechemites, and he settles there, and he sets up an altar to God, and he worships. And it's almost like it's an attempt to cover up his disobedience. Like, look, I'm still worshiping God. And it's an outward expression of this worship. It's a public act, but his heart was not in it. And even though he's been given a new name and a new identity, he's still the old Jacob right now in this story. He's not living that new identity. 
And Kent Hughes describes him as morally weak, unwilling to pay the cost of right actions, untrusting of God, and unmindful of the welfare of his children and the future of his people. And like I said, the, the story that we're looking at today is a hard one, and it contains proof of all of those things. All of those descriptors of Jacob are true. And it's a cautionary tale of what happens when God's people do not live out the God-given identity that they have, that they have received from him. And this is a difficult passage. And actually, when, I was, uh, when Charlie and I were, were planning out who was going to preach what throughout the summer, I was like, who's going to get this passage? And... It ends up, it's me, so I'm going to try to do justice. I'm going to do my best with it. But in all seriousness, there are some difficult topics that we are going to touch upon as we explore this, this story, including topics such as sexual assault and mass murder or genocide. And so I want to warn you up front so that you can be prepared. If there's kids in the room, maybe they should go into kids' ministry if um, something has happened in your life um, that kind of is similar to those things, then I just want you to be prepared. And uh, like I said, I believe that there's a message for us, even though this story is pretty terrible. So I want to pray for us, and then we'll get into the story. Let's pray. Father, you are a God of healing and a God of wholeness. And as we just sung today, you are a God who will never let us go, who is faithful to us our whole lives, who reveals his goodness to us time and time again. And we thank you that you are that God. And today we pray for peace and comfort that comes from you, Father. We pray for eyes to see the message that you have for us in this passage. And we thank you that you are here with us and you are speaking to us by your spirit. We pray these things in Jesus' name. All right, so we have been talking about the patriarchs, the Abraham and Isaac and now Jacob, and we've seen that they all have deceptive dealings in their life, um, that they were living with the inhabitants of a certain land, and then they dealt with them in a way that was not upright. It happened with Abraham, it happened with Isaac, and we've been looking now at this theme in uh, how, how God's family is God's beloved and dysfunctional family. And we've been tracing the legacy of deception as it's passed from generation to generation, but we've also been seeing how God keeps renewing these promises that he's made to this family in each generation as well. And so we're going to see that this morning as well. So we're going to be in Genesis 34. If you want to turn to your, in your Bibles to that, there's some pew Bibles if you don't have one with you, or it'll be on the screen. And I'm going to start reading in verse 1. Now Dinah, the daughter Leah had born to Jacob, went out to visit the women of the land, and when Shechem, son of Hamor the Hivite, the ruler of that area, saw her, he took her and raped her. His heart was drawn to Dinah, daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. And Shechem said to his father, Hamor, get me this girl as my wife. Now I want to pause and just say, if this is something that has happened to you in your story, then I, I do want to just say, I am with you. I am sorry. This is something that it breaks my heart, it breaks God's heart. This is not what God wants for us. He hates injustice and mistreatment and oppression, and he wants wholeness and healing for you. And so I want to express that from the bottom of my heart as we explore this story. And, and there is some significance in verse 1 when it says that Dinah went out to visit the women of the land. Because Jacob and his family were supposed to be set apart. They were supposed to be living somewhere other than where, uh, where they were. They were supposed to be living somewhere God wanted them. And in the culture of the time, if Dinah was of marrying age, she was not supposed to leave the camp without a chaperone. But she did out of curiosity. She wanted to explore what was happening around her. And the worst possible thing happened to her. And I am not saying this um, to say that it was her fault. I am not blaming her. It was not her fault what happened to her. But I'm saying this to point out that this is the first deception of many in the story that we're exploring. And that's the, the deception that God's ways are better than our ways. And how he wants us to live is not as good as how the world lives. And if we're Christians, we, like Jacob and his family, are supposed to be set apart we are set apart by God and for himself, and we're called to live a certain way. Our creator set forth a way for us to live so that we would flourish. And the world that we live in is broken, and it's distorted, and it's not our home, and it's not where God ultimately wants us. 
But this world can look so attractive to us. And sometimes we choose to go out and dabble in it and we think, you know, it's gonna be okay. I'm just gonna like adopt this little practice from the world. It's gonna be fine. It's harmless. But if we are not careful how we interact with this attractive yet broken world, then we are failing to live with wisdom and discernment and we will fall prey to its deception as well. And our fate may not be the same as Dinah's, but we could also end up devastated destroyed by our idolatry, our compromise, our attempts to live in identities other than the one that God has given us. And this is not one of those only come to church and only hang out with Christian sermons. That's not what I'm saying today. But it is a call to watch your life and to live in this world without living as if you are from this world. We are from God and we have a different purpose and a different destiny. Psalm 1, 1 to 3 says, that, says this, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. And the Bible is full of these warnings. We can read Ephesians 5, 15 to 16. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Or Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And finally, 1 Peter 5, 8, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Because we do have an enemy who is seeking to destroy us. And the way that he does that is through deception. And so do not be deceived. Now, as we go through this story, I do just want to mention that Dinah doesn't have much to say in what happens to her throughout the rest of the story. The prince of Shechem ends up falling in love with her and he wants to marry her and he keeps her in his house, which is like, oh, thanks, bro. Um, and we don't know if she returned the feelings because she was entirely left out of the conversation. Jacob and his sons decide her future. We don't hear anything from her in this passage. She's only mentioned a few times, but never has any direct input into her story. And I'm not saying that I'm supporting that just because that's what's happening in that cultural time. But that is what was the reality that they lived in, and so that's what we're working with this morning. And so let's go on in verse 5. When Jacob heard that his daughter Dinah had been defiled, his sons were in the field with his livestock. So he did nothing about it until they came home. Now this is... Again, where we see Jacob's weakness and his lack of concern for his family. He hears about what happened to his Dinah, and why, rather than be outraged, he does nothing. He just waits. My sons will come home soon. Then we'll figure it out. And one of the reasons why this is probably happening is explained in verse 1, where it says, Dinah was Leah's daughter. And Leah was Jacob's wife, but Jacob didn't love her. And that attitude apparently trickled down to Leah's children as well. And so it's not as simplistic as that. Jacob was likely trying to also think of a wise way to react and consider his response. But he comes across as apathetic, where he should be outraged. And I just want to say, friends, when you hear stories like this, doing nothing is not an appropriate response. Let's be people who fight for justice in situations like this, who give a voice to the voiceless, no matter how we feel about them. Let us not come across as apathetic to the pain that people are experiencing around us. And so Jacob's sons eventually come home and they hear the story and they're furious and they're shocked because this should not have happened. This is outrageous. Shechem has done an outrageous thing and their outrage was likely fueled by their father's inaction. But now Shechem loves Dinah and he wants to marry her. And so he sends his father to Jacob and or he and his father come to Jacob and, and they're like, we, wanna, we, we want my son to marry, marry Dinah. So let's pick up the story in verse eight. But Hamor said to them, my son Shechem has his heart set on your daughter. Please give her to him as his wife. Intermarry with us. Give us your daughters and take our daughters for yourselves. You can settle among us. The land is open to you. Live in it, trade in it, and acquire property in it. And then Shechem said to Dinah's father and brothers, let me find favor in your eyes and I will give you whatever you ask. Make the price for the bride and the gift I am to bring you as great as you like and I'll pay whatever you ask me. 
only give me this young woman as my wife. And Shechem really wants Dinah. And he and his father make a case for why this marriage would be so good for them economically. You know, first they'll enter into a treaty involving intermarriage and presumably that will strengthen the tribes. And so they'll be able to pursue economic prosperity and they can use the land and they can grow and expand. And second, they'll give Jacob and sons whatever they, whatever they want as a dowry. For, for Dinah, they've, they've, they're prepared to be as generous as, as, as Jacob and, and his sons want. And here's more deception. Because Dinah's brothers are still really mad. And so they listen to what they have to say. And then in verse 13 we read, Because their sister Dinah had been defiled, Jacob's sons replied deceitfully as they spoke to Shechem and his father Hamor. They said to them, we can't do such a thing. We can't give our sister to a man who is not circumcised. That would be a disgrace to us. We will enter into an agreement with you on one condition only, that you become like us by circumcising all your males, and then we will give you our daughters and take your daughters for ourselves. We'll settle among you and become one people with you, but if you will not agree to be circumcised, we'll take our sister and go. And so Dinah's brothers enact a plan of revenge they ignore the economic potential of a treaty and they use their, the focus of their religious custom of circumcision in order to negotiate. It's Israel's most holy custom. And that's the reason why they can't intermarry. And that's a legitimate reason. But they abuse it. And we're going to see how. But um, the Shechemites, you know, they're like, okay, we really want Dinah. Shechem really wants Dinah. And so let's consider this. And so um, they, they're like, if you do this, we'll be able to intermarry. And this is not what God wants for this family. And can you see Jacob's legacy of deceiver taking an even deeper hold in this family? They're still struggling with men here. They're taking justice into their own hands. And so um, Hamor and Shechem agree and they convince all the males in their city to undergo circumcision and they're like, okay, we just have to do this one thing and then they're going to live in our land and we can marry their daughters and they can marry our daughters and then all their livestock and property will be ours. So let's agree to this thing. Hamor and Shechem seem to be dealing with their own shady motives at this moment as well. So there's even more deception in this story. And so while Shechem's desire to marry Dinah seems genuine, their motives for the treaty beyond that marriage are less than honorable. But everyone agrees and all the men get circumcised. And then we read in verse 25, three days later, while all of them were still in pain, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and attacked the unsuspecting city, killing every male. They put Hamor and his son Shechem to the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house and left. The sons of Jacob came upon dead bodies and looted the city where their sister had been defiled. They seized their flocks and herds and donkeys and everything else of theirs in the city and out in the fields. And they carried off all the wealth and all their women and children, taking as plunder everything in the houses. And so here we see the result of Jacob's son's deceptions. They take advantage of the fact that all these men are ailing and they're weakened as they recover. And they storm the city and they kill them all. And not just Shechem who had wronged Dinah, not even just Shechem and his family. They took revenge upon themselves and they killed every male in the city. People who had not participated in that crime. And not only that, they looted the city and they took all the belongings that these people had and they took all their animals and their, their flocks and their wealth and they took all the women and children. And this is the part that astounds me. The very thing that they're avenging, they do themselves. Maybe they don't violate these women as Dinah had been, but they take them as slaves against their will and they force them to live under oppression. And once again, in this story, we are, we are forced to pause and consider how far down Jacob's family has sunk. You know, a few weeks ago, we looked at Jacob's or Isaac's story of deception and, and his motives were self-preservation. But here, Simeon and Levi, their motives were vengeance. And they seem to care more about their own reputation than even the welfare, the, the welfare or the wishes of their sister Dinah, who had this crime had been portrayed against. And they went so far beyond what was even a reasonable response and a reasonable punishment for what happened to Dinah. They murdered innocent people who had nothing to do with it. And then in the process, they made themselves worse than Shechem and the Hivites. How has this family sunk as low as they have? 
Although they're supposed to be a nation that blesses other nations, they have done the exact opposite. And it's striking that in the previous chapter, Esau had met Jacob with grace and forgiveness for the way he had been treated. But Jacob's sons are shown as evildoers in comparison to Esau here. And here's something that's worth noting. There is no mention of God in this chapter. No promises, no prayers, no divine revelations. The only reference to God is an indirect reference in that they talk about their religious ritual of circumcision, which is the physical representation of the covenant or the promise that God made with Abraham, and they misuse it and abuse it for their own revenge. This is how low they've sunk. Although God had given them an identity, they have not been living it. It's hard to live out a God-given identity when you're not meditating on him, remembering his promises to you, spending time in prayer to align your heart with him. I mean, it's hard enough to live out a God-given identity when you are doing those things. It's not surprising that, the thing, that things got as bad as they got with Jacob's family. Jacob's not listening to God. He's not obeying God. He's not teaching his children to do these things. He's gone all the way. He, if he had gone all the way to Bethel as God had asked, none of this terrible stuff would have happened. All of this was due to his disobedience and his distrust in God, even though God had proven himself faithful time and time again in his life. And that's the lesson for us all. This terrible story is a picture of what happens when we forget God's presence and promises and work in our lives. When we forgot that we have a God-given identity, that we are his children, adopted, wanted sons and daughters of the king of the universe, that we are followers and imitators of Christ, that we are made new in him, that we are his ambassadors, that we are holy and set apart and meant to become more like Christ in our lives, that we are members of the body of Christ and that we are co-heirs with him, sharing in his inheritance of glory. That's our identity. But do we live that way? Is this foremost in our minds as we approach our daily lives? Is this the filter through which we look at and deal with the challenges that we face in life? Or do we, like Jacob, live forgetful? I think I tend to live more like Jacob sometimes than I do the other way. And I wish I lived more into my God-given identity. I really do. And I bet at this moment Jacob is thinking the same thing. I wish that I was living different. Is God going to give up on him and cancel his promises because we've done this terrible thing? Well, the story in in chapter 34 ends with Jacob rebuking his sons for what they did and not because it was morally reprehensible, but because he felt it endangered his household and and himself. His fear is that the surrounding nations are going to attack and that they wouldn't stand a chance if that happened and that they would be destroyed And that's pretty understandable because based on his son's own sense of justice, that's what they deserve. But what happened to God's God's word to Jacob in Genesis 28, 15, when when God tells him, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. Or Genesis 31, 3, when the Lord says to Jacob, go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. Or even the words that came out of Jacob's own mouth in Genesis 31.5, but the God of my father has been with me. Or Genesis 31.42, if the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been with me, you would have surely sent me away empty-handed. But God has seen my hardship and the toil of my hands. Jacob should be clinging to these promises right now, remembering what God has done for him and how he has provided for him and protected him, and how he has removed the terrible identity of deceiver and given him this new, better identity. But remember, Jacob didn't trust fully in God. He went in the direction that God told him, but he didn't get there. He didn't get all the way there. And like Jacob, when I find myself in situations where I have not fully trusted in or obeyed God, I'm tempted to despair. I'm tempted to believe that God's going to abandon me now. But friends, this is not what our unchanging God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, does. 
God is silent in chapter 34, yes, but in chapter 35, he is all over the place, and we're going to turn there now. In verse 1, it says, Then God said to Jacob, Go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. Once again, we don't see God punishing Jacob and being like, okay, we're just going to take a moment here. I've got to reconsider what's happening. I'm going to leave you guys to your demise, and I'm going to find someone else to work with. He comes back, and he reiterates his initial command. He's like, okay, Jacob, go back to Bethel. And in doing so, he reminds Jacob of his presence with him, of his sovereign way, and that his ways are better than our ways than Jacob's ways. And so in verse two, it says, so Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in their ears and Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem and then they set out and the terror of God fell on the towns all around them so that no one pursued them. Jacob and all the people with him came to Luz, that is Bethel, and in the, in the land of Canaan. And there he built an altar and he called the place El Bethel because it is there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. God once again repeats the call, and this time Jacob's response is to repent. Now he's going to trust God, and now he's going to obey, and he's going to return to the will of God. And God protects him supernaturally from the threat of the surrounding nation so that Jacob can successfully obey him this time. And we can also learn from Jacob's response. We can also figure out from this story what to do when we find ourselves too enthralled with the world around us and not living for God, but living for ourselves. And when we ourselves are struggling to live out our God-given identity and struggling to trust in God's good plan for our lives. God calls Jacob back and he immediately jumps into action. He calls all his household and the people who were with him. That would include the Hivite women and children that they have kidnapped. And he, he, he says, okay, everyone, we've got to get rid of our foreign gods and purify ourselves. Jacob and his family would have been uh, defiled in two ways. First, they were defiled physically from, the con- from contact with dead bodies. So they needed to physically and ritually cleanse themselves. And second, they were defiled religiously because the loot that they had taken from the Hivite household contained idols. And Jacob has finally remembered that God has been with him and that he made a vow to follow God. And now he wants his family to be right with God as well. And so they have to ditch all their idols and they, and they have to get rid of their jewelry, which might sound weird, but it wasn't actually just plain jewelry. It was likely made from amulets and talismans that had like pagan uh, symbols engraved on them. And so they needed to get rid of that. And another reason that they needed to do that is because in the Old Testament, there are instances where gold was melted down to create idols. And I'm sure that's sparking something in your memory, but the most well-known of that one is when the Israelites were in the wilderness after leaving Egypt, and they melted down all their gold to create the golden calf. And so they needed to not have that temptation. They needed to uh, cleanse themselves, and they needed to get rid of the influences of and the temptation to do that. And so they had to wash themselves and change their clothes. And changing their clothes was a symbol of moving from one state to another. And so I want to pause here and think about what this means for us. You know, it's easy to read this story up till now and judge Jacob and his sons uh, for their actions and for their lack of faith. And, And of course, we would never get so revengeful that we would commit mass murder. Of course not. Of course we have never been that bad. Maybe there are evil people in the world who do that, and yes, there are, but that would not be us. But what we need to remember is that Jesus said in Matthew 5, 22, I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, which is a term of contempt, is answerable to the court, and anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. And then he goes on to say that if you're about to enter into worship and remember that someone has something against you, that you are to go and reconcile with them before you present your offering of worship to the Lord. And then he says that looking at someone lustfully is just as bad as committing adultery. And then he says that we're to radically love our enemies and that we are to walk with integrity in all we do. 
And that's just a short list that comes out of the Sermon on the Mount that we read in Matthew 5 through 7. When we look at all those commands, when we compare our lives to that list, or when we hear Jesus say in Mark 12, 30 that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength, then maybe we start to see how easy it could be to fail and that we don't have a leg to stand on and we can't justify ourselves. And what Jacob and his sons needed and what we also need, our only hope in this lies in the ultimate son of Jacob, the ultimate Israel, which is Jesus, who bore the wrath of God for our sin and who turns that wrath away from all of us who believe. And so that just as Jacob and his sons put on new robes and symbolize their repentance, that they're not the old Jacob and sons anymore, that they're living a new identity. The Apostle Paul calls us to do the same in Ephesians 4, 22. Put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. In their repentance, Jacob and his family purged the idols and their jewelry from their tents and they put on new clothes. And my question today is, what do we need to purge from our lives? Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's self-centeredness or greed or failure to trust in God. Or maybe it's something you're grasping onto so hard because you believe it will save you and you're struggling to release that grip and to hold on to Jesus instead. Whatever it is, we can rid our lives of those things. Freedom is possible. It's not easy, but it is possible. And by his spirit, God will help us to obey him and he will be faithful. Jacob and his household end up going to Bethel and Jacob builds an altar and this time he is worshiping. This time his heart is in it. And this time he is worshiping in spirit and in truth. And look at verse 9. After Jacob returned from Padan Aram, God appeared to him again and blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. And so he named him Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you, and kings will be among your descendants. The land I gave Abraham and Isaac, I also give to you, and I will give this land to your descendants after him. And then God went up from him at the place where he had talked with him. God reiterates Jacob's new identity. He's like, Jacob, remember who you are. And he reiterates the promises that he'd given to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. God in his grace has not held Jacob's failures against him. He's rained his grace down on Jacob. He has rained down lavish love and patience. And there's nothing Jacob or his sons had done that God couldn't redeem. And there's nothing that you or I have done that God can't redeem. There's still a lot of residual sin and consequences in Jacob's story, and we don't have time to go into it today. We're going to explore those later in in subsequent weeks. But God disciplines his children, and, and Jacob and his sons do not escape the discipline and the consequences for their actions, but there is also redemption at the end for them. And there is redemption for us. When we lay down our idols when we stop striving and struggling with men and and when we lay down our sin and we turn to God, he gives us new clothes, symbolizing that we are moving from one state to another, from living our lives for ourselves to living our lives for him. That is the best and most abundant love. He clothes us in righteousness and holiness. He imparts Jesus' perfect record to us so that we can live in freedom because of that. We may also have to face discipline from God and consequences for our actions. But God will redeem our story. And that's something that we can always trust in. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you that you are a God who continually speaks promises and and identity over us. Thank you that you are a God who never leaves us, who always chases us. 
Thank you that if we are in Christ, there is nothing that we could do to make you love us more and nothing we have done that would make you love us less. Father, I pray this morning that you would help us to walk in that truth, that we would not be like Jacob, wavering in our faith, unsure of the promises, even though you've proven them time and time again. Father, I pray that you would strengthen us and empower us to live as you have called us to live, to live out this new identity that you have called us to. We thank you that you are with us. We thank you that we are not to do this on our own, that you are with us and you do this in us by your spirit. And so we just praise you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you've got kids that you're intending on picking up, could you wait till after we've um, shared communion together? I appreciate that. So this morning, if you are here, you can uh, raise your hand and a mic will come to you, or you can text. And if you are online watching us, please feel free to text us with your questions. Does anybody in the room have a question? And we don't have one online either. Oh, so Basil, Cheryl, Basil, Basil. Okay. Well, I knew Basil. It's, com would come it's coming through. to you. <laughs> it's coming to you. Thank you for uh, thank you for that message, Cheryl. Difficult, right? And uh, but uh, thank you so much for speaking from your heart. Um, you know, when I uh, when I hear your message, and and these scriptures, although I know that. God ordained it from the beginning of time, I almost see God in heaven, the Father, saying, oh, this world needs Jesus. This world needs Jesus. He would see something like this and say how this world needs, like, this law of love and the power of the Holy Spirit for us to be able to live out that love. So I, I just see it all as... You know, also God's grief in all of this, but, you know, his power for us in the life of Christ, right? And, and that it's only lived by the power of the Holy Spirit through us, but this law of love. So I just, it was a comment, but I'm sure you have some things to say about that too. Oh, absolutely. And I, th I think my favorite part of the whole sermon that I just preached was when I, I just talk about, like, Jacob's sons, they're failing and they're, you know, not doing what they're supposed to do, but what we need is the ultimate son of Jacob, which is Jesus. And, and that was God's plan all along. And yes, his heart is broken, even now by the things that are happening in this world. And, and that, is, that should be an impetus for us, an insp inspiration for us to share Jesus with the people around us because this world is hard. Living in this world is hard. And so we need each other to live this Christian life, but we need each other to share this gospel with other people who don't know Jesus yet. Thanks, Basil. So I have a question here. As a woman of God, what do you do to strengthen your relationship with him if you're feeling lost, when you feel like you're doing everything right but still feel disconnected? What can you do to feel closer to the Lord as a woman? I personally, I'm just going to talk about my personal life because that's all I can say. But um, being in the word is really important to me. And I have... I was recently reminded that that is something I was looking at like habits and like how um, I think I read this article about Jerry Seinfeld. This, I, I promise this is going to turn to Jesus, but Jerry Seinfeld like is one of the most um, successful comedians in his uh, in his time in, in our time. And what he did is someone, someone, a young comedian asked him, like, what's your story of success? Like, how did you do it? And he said, I wrote every day. And he said, my job is to make a chain of having written every day, like cross it off on my calendar and to not break that chain. And that was just kind of a reminder to me of like, I need to do that with my personal devotional life with Jesus. That's not the only thing I do, but that is something that, you know, God, it's God's main revelation to me and to us 
And so I need to be unbroken in the chain of reading his word every day and spending time with him and hearing his identity for me. Because if we get up in the morning, and this is something I do, this is not something I'm perfect at, but if I get up in the morning and the first thing I do is turn on my phones and scroll through Instagram or scroll through whatever or check my email, then I am not tuning my heart to the God's identity that he's spoken over me. I'm tuning my heart to what the world is screaming at me that I should be. And so that's one thing I just want to, that's my, my hope and my prayer that I would become more disciplined in, in reading my Bible and in spending time with God. Another thing that is really important to me, and it's like probably like the thing that helps me the most is spending time with other Christians and being, not being alone in this journey. We often emphasize what I just said, you know, like spend your personal devotional time in the morning or in the evening if that's where you're, when you're better. And, you know, like that's, that's what we need to focus on. But we also need other people because sometimes we struggle to remember when things are hard. As Nita said before I preached, as Basil said, as many of you have probably felt, like this world is hard and we need each other. And sometimes it's hard to see the truth of God, it's hard to experience God. They, this person mentioned that they feel disconnected. Sometimes we feel disconnected. Sometimes I feel disconnected. I think everyone who is walking this Christian life feels disconnected from time to time. But what happens when we get together with other people in our struggle is that they can speak the truth into our lives. They can remind us of who we are. They can remind us of who God is. They can remind us of the ways that God has actually seen, been seen working in our lives so that when we are struggling to see it, they can see it for us. It's like the story of Moses when the Israelites are fighting. I forget who they're fighting, but they're fighting some enemy. And Moses, as long as he has his hands raised up in prayer, they're, they're prevailing and they're winning. But the second that his hands get tired and he lowers his arms, they start to lose. And so two people came alongside Moses, and on each, one on each side, and they held his arms up. And that's what we need to be for each other. That's what we need from each other. That when we are struggling, someone is on either side of us holding up our arms. I would also add that at Westview, we've got quite a few spiritual directors. And the role of the spiritual director is to help you experience God's love for you. It's about building intimacy. So if you're interested in knowing more, you can either talk to one of them or you can reach out and talk to me. Can I just add one more thing? If you are, are feeling that God is not with you, if you're feeling disconnected from him, that doesn't mean he's not with you. And so sometimes we, we like, oh, I don't feel like my prayer was heard or I don't feel like God's with me. And, and, and that's the, the time when we need to speak to ourselves the truth that we know about our unchanging God to dictate to our emotions, this is what's true. What I'm feeling right now is not necessarily true. So that's another thing I do, stay connected. Yes. What about someone who continues in unrepentant sin that they know is not right before God? How do we relate to that person? Well, I think that's between them and God first and foremost. God's going to deal with that person. It's not our place to judge them. And I think there's things that we all struggle with in our lives. And so if, if we are honest about where we're at with our struggles, then we don't really have a leg to stand on, that we can come alongside them and, and support them and encourage them to, and, and hold them accountable to uh, dealing with this sin that's in their life. But that we ultimately trust that God is the one that's going to change their heart. And so we can pray for them for that, that God would change their affections, that God would change their heart. But we can't, we can't act out in, you know, vengeance for the Lord because God says that's his. And Jesus died for that person just as much as he died for us. And, and I have things that I struggle with in my life too. And so I don't, I can't judge that person. I can only pray for them and encourage them. So this is going to be an interesting one. Does lust exist in marriage, and is it wrong? Okay, so I'm not married, but I am willing to bet that, yes, it does. Um, I think lust is something that you can struggle with regardless of your marital status. I think that I, I've read enough articles about pornography to know that there are um, people who engage in lustful activities. That's, that's why affairs happen. That's why porn addictions happen. And... 
What was the question again? <laughs> Does it exist in marriage? My, my answer is yes. <laughs> but you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. So this person's asking why there's still so many rituals among religions. Why are they, like, why, why am I? Or? Why is there still so many rituals oh. among religions? Um, I'm, I'm just going to speak to Christianity, the, the rituals that we have. Um, there are things that we do, like we're going we're gonna to move into communion um, in, in a few minutes, and, and that's, that's a ritual. Um, the reason why we do these rituals is that it helps us to connect with God. It helps to remind us, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Actually, can we segue into to communion right away? Totally. So, yeah, cool. So I'll just have the, the musicians come back up. But um, the rituals that we do, the, the communion, the baptism, the coming to church every day and singing songs, those are all things that we do in order to reconnect ourselves with God. And the rituals of connecting with him throughout the week are so that we don't forget our identity, so that we don't forget what God has done for us in Christ and what he has done for us in, um, on the cross and what he has spoken into our lives so that we can continue to live this identity day in and day out when things get hard and when it's easy to forget. We can continue to live these out as we engage in these rituals. Now, I'm not saying that every ritual that ever existed in the church was helpful. There are times when things become tradition and kind of like sacred cows that we don't want to get rid of that, um, that are not in the Bible, but we do really try, at least at Westview, to, um, to make sure that we are faithful to scripture, faithful to uh, what God has called us to do, and those rituals are pointing us to the Lord and reminding us of our identity. There's one more question, which I think will, okay. will just transition us further. When one feels defiled, how does forgiveness work and love exist in Christ-likeness? Can you read it one more time? When one feels defiled, how does forgiveness work and love exist in Christ? Oh, forgiveness is, forgiveness is available for us. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And Jesus said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and, and you'll be saved. You know, forgiveness, forgiveness is ready and available for us. Forgiveness is not something we need to earn from Jesus because he's covered all of our sins. Because when he died on the cross, he didn't die for like everyone up to a certain point. He died for all of us and for all of the sins that we were going to commit and we have committed and are going to commit. And, you know, like he, is, he, he covered it all. And so he invites us to just turn and like Jacob, you know, like Jacob did, did, did get rid of stuff in his life in order to be able to worship God fully. And we need to do that too. And, and, and not getting rid of those things doesn't necessarily mean our forgiveness is not available to us, but it does distract us from fully worshiping God and living for him. And so forgiveness is available. Forgiveness, like it's, it's free. It's a thing. You, you ask God for it and he will give it to you. Amen. <laughs>